I'm mostly going to ramble on about graphics technology and hindsight on the Doom 3 engine and where I'm going for the next generation and talk a little bit about sound and some of the other technologies. I, so the decisions that I made with the Doom 3 renderer were made over four years ago and they turned out pretty good as far as I'm concerned with how the hardware evolved and what we were able to produce in the game with that. But it is still time now to go ahead and reevaluate where things are with the current hardware and where things are likely to be over the next several years and basically make a new rendering engine based on those decisions. Mm -hmm. So there's a few flaws that you can see in Doom 3 if you look at it I'm, from a graphics perspective. One of the most obvious ones is that you get some seams down some of the character heads where uh, a mirroring repeat is used uh, on the texturing. And that's not so much an engine problem as just we should spend the extra texture memory to go ahead and not have any texture seams across directly visible areas. But there may be some things that I do with uh, uh, the calculation of the, the tangent space vectors that can clean that up a little bit. Uh, one of the other things that people have commented on is uh, the skin tone on the characters doesn't necessarily look uh, particularly realistic uh, as a skin tone. Part of that can be attributed to the fact that we only have a single level of specularity. You know, there is only one kind of power factor that goes on onto everything. We can make brighter or dimmer specular highlights, but we can't make tighter and broader specular highlights. <laughs> And that's mostly a result of the original engine being done on the, the notchy feature sets of the early register combiners for the NV10, NV20 class hardware, where with anything that's DX9 class hardware or more modern, that's basically uh, NV30 or R300 class, uh, there's no reason whatsoever to have limitations to a particular specular uh, exponent. And it's, we don't actually use an exponent. It's not a power series like a conventional uh, cosine raised to a you know to a particular power on there where it's actually in doom a kind of a windowed function that does some bias and squares uh, it was something that worked out reasonably on the early fixed function hardware and was actually a little bit easier to control because it has a very finite fall off where in theory classical fong shading with uh, a cosine exponent on there uh, doesn't ever completely fall off and you wind up with a slight uh, addition across everything and it's a little bit nicer to be able to have that completely windowed off but the, uh, the fragment program paths actually do use a texture lookup table for the specular exponent. And I just made that texture to be exactly what was calculated in the earlier uh, fixed function hardware. But you can easily replace that with anything that you want. And what I've done in the, the, newer, uh, the newer rendering paths is made it a two-dimensional texture. So all of the specular lookups uh, happen with an additional rendering map that has the specularity factor in there. Uh, what we call specular maps in, uh, in Doom 3 are more commonly called gloss maps, where it's just uh, affecting the intensity of the specular highlight. But we now also add in new technology the ability to change uh, you know, the, bright, uh, the breadth of the specular highlight on there. And that lets you do a lot of interesting things with uh, the highlight that we've got in Doom is really quite broad for a specular. And it's about what you'd get on a really dull uh, plastic. Uh, it's something that wasn't very shiny, and it's kind of a fairly broad spread out thing. And you don't get anything that looks like a really good metallic highlight, uh, you know, or things that would be shiny cast plastic. So there's a lot of neat stuff that you get uh, just playing with that and going ahead and having some that are even broader uh, and some that tighten down really uh, a whole lot to give you bright little pinpoint highlights on there. Uh, the other issue with specularity is that uh, you can see in some cases in Doom where if you have a really broad triangular surface or a broad surface with very low polygon tessellation, uh, Doom uses half angle interpolation for the specular calculation, again, because that's all that was reasonable to do with the fixed function hardware early on. Uh, I much prefer to use actual reflection vector calculation which uh, doesn't involve any nonlinear calculations at vertexes. What that means is that if you take a really large box room in Doom and punch a hole in the center of it so you've got some funny triangulations going on, and then you have a bright light with a specular highlight moving around, as you walk around, the shape of the highlight will change quite a bit depending on where it is in the triangular surface, even though it shouldn't based on the location of the viewer and, uh, uh, and light source. So that is another fairly straightforward thing that gets addressed where with reflection vector calculations, no matter what the underlying triangle tessellation is, you get exactly the correct um, highlight on there. 
Uh, another minor thing that you see in Doom, again, on big flat surfaces with the specular highlights is that there's a graininess to the, uh, the specular highlight. And that's actually mostly due to using uh, cubic environment maps for normalization. Uh, when that's replaced with uh, direct calculations, uh, again, only in the R2 path on there, you get a, uh, a better quality highlight on there. But there's still a small amount that goes in. There's two normalizations that happen. Uh, one of them I did replace with uh, calculations. The other one's still with uh, a lookup map on there. So there's a slight quality improvement to, again, placing that uh, into mathematical calculations instead of texture lookups. Mm. One of the other things that you notice in uh, basically everything using normal maps right now, when you've got specular highlights on there, and it becomes much more apparent when you add tighter specular highlights, is there's a degree of aliasing where normally people think about aliasing just at the edges of polygons, where if you've got a thin railing, you get an obvious uh, kind of notchy pixel edge at the side uh, when you've got it in front of a, a background that's lit differently. And hardware anti-aliasing does a good job at addressing this. But as we get more sophisticated with what we're doing inside surfaces, we've got whole new classes of aliasing that are coming into it, which are in-surface aliasing based on um, the actual texture calculations. So what happens in games that have normal maps on there is uh, the calculations where you may have a specular highlight that happens at the interpolated point between uh, one sample and another where one facet may be pointing up, one facet may be pointing off to the right. And depending on where the viewer and the eye is, some combination uh, either at those points or in between them may have a really bright specular highlight. And Doom doesn't suffer from it too badly because the specular highlights tend to be very broad. But as you tighten it up, it does get to be more of a problem where uh, you get slight movements cause the bilinear interpolation or trilinear interpolation on the surface to generate normals that either approach or move away from the exact specular highlight. And that will cause little shimmery speckles to happen on the surface as things uh, you know, go in and out of the exact highlight point on the reflection vector. So this is something that I'm still working on uh, various techniques to, to combat on there. But the primary direction that I'm looking at is to uh, go ahead and analyze the actual surface normals along with the specularity factor and basically dim out the, or broaden the specular highlight as more geometry is pushed into whatever may be covered by the filter kernel on there. And that seems pretty promising on there, and it works nicely. One minor drawback is that it does wind up having to uh, tie together the specularity maps and the normal maps where you wouldn't have the freedom to take a single surface and flip a different normal map onto it without having a matching specularity map on it. So they become kind of multiple channels of a, uh, you know, uh, of a more complex, complex data structure on there. Uh, that also get, takes away the ability to scale and rotate them independently because it again looks like just a deep multi-channel texture. And several of the things that we do are sort of like that, where you could look at a, a given surface that has uh, a normal map, uh, a diffuse map, a specular map, uh, a specularity map, a gloss map, a subsurface map, and all of these things. Uh, they can be treated sort of as separate maps, but if you start doing some of this analysis and modification across the different levels, uh, they really become much more like uh, a 14-channel or 16-channel deep uh, single texture on there. And that's one of the, the minor issues that I'm not completely clear on what I'm going to do enforcing that inside the engine. Another major thing that, uh, that turned out to be a cheap and really effective quality improvement is doing renormalization of the normal maps uh, before it does all the lighting calculations. Now, normally, there's some benefit to when you have the hardware going ahead and doing trilinear interpolation on your normal maps. Uh, because you've got a normal pointing one way and another one pointing another way, when it does an interpolation between there that's linear, it winds up having a unit, a normal vector that's no longer unit length. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not a huge problem because most normal vectors tend to be pretty close to each other. But when you have like tight little fillets and little gouges in things, you wind up having normals that may tilt over you know, a 45 degree angle or so. And that is a fairly significant amount of denormalization there. So, you can easily, in a fragment program based system, renormalize those after you fetch the samples. 
Uh, that exacerbates the aliasing problem with uh, in-surface in specular highlights and such, but it makes a lot of surfaces look a whole lot better, where you can go up to surfaces that may have been, uh, when you walk up to them, they would have been just kind of more blurry smears right now. And with renormalization, you can actually see a little one unit wide normal map uh, divot becomes a nice corner rounded uh, indentation in the surface. And that's not that expensive and looks really good on there. The biggest change that's likely to be happening in the next generation renderer is moving to shadow buffers instead of shadow volumes. And this was one of those large kind of key strategic decisions that had to be made early on in the Doom renderer, where I had early on uh, a version of the code that would render both shadow buffers and shadow volumes on there so I could compare the, the different performance and visual quality trade-offs on there. And at the time, there was a lot of speculation about which way things should go. Uh, and some people thought that shadow buffers might have been a better choice on there. Uh, having done much more work on it now, uh, it's really clear that uh, a generalized rendering architecture would not have been viable with shadow buffers in Doom's time frame for, to cover our entire target market on there. What I'm doing right now is it's not 100% clear yet that it's going to be viable for our next generation target on there, but I, I have pretty good hopes for it. We just have to get some cooperation with the, the video card vendors on some issues to get all the performance issues cleared up as much as possible. The issues with shadow buffers are, when I was able to test them early on in Doom's, uh, in Doom's development, there weren't any without fragment programs and without dedicated shadow buffer hardware, which came along for the first time on the, the GeForce 3 uh, NV20 class systems on there, uh, you could get, you could do things with alpha test and some other hacks to go ahead and compare against shadow buffers. And you could do multiple, multiple layers to crutch up the fact that you've only got eight bits of depth precision. And you could make an engine that would work with that. But visually, it looked really bad where Everybody complains about the hard edges on stencil shadows on there. But with uh, the way that you could do shadow volumes before, you had hard edges and they weren't even straight. You had these awful distorted pixel edges uh, that looked really, really bad, even at quite high resolutions. So when I sat down to work on the new technology, I, I sat back. And again, the reasons you want to do shadow buffers instead of shadow volumes uh, is mainly that the shadow volumes require us to do a lot of work on the CPU, which does make do more CPU bound than I would prefer. Um, so it makes things where you have to generate all the, the coordinates for any animation on there uh, on the CPU because you need to do uh, shadow volumes off of that. And you need to do all these calculations for even static objects that are inside moving lights. I am, you know, or of course, moving objects past static lights. The shadow silhouettes always need to be detected and generate new indexes and vertexes. There's things that Doom does to try to crutch up around there, where with vertex programs, we can have static lists of vertexes for the shadows and just generate new indexes indexes based off of them, but it's still a significant issue. We spend a pretty good amount of time uh, messing with the shadow silhouettes on there. Um, with shadow buffers, the new versions that I've been working with, uh, there's a few things that have changed since the original uh, time of Doom on there, uh, the original Doom 3 engine specifications. One is that we have fragment programs now, so we can do pretty sophisticated filtering on there. And that turns out to be really the key critical thing. Even if you take the built-in hardware percentage closer filtering and you render obscenely high resolution shadow maps, you know, 2000 by 2000 or more than that, it still doesn't look good. Uh, in general, it's easy to make them look much worse than the stencil shadow volumes when you're in that kind of basic hardware only level filtering on it. Uh, you wind up with all the problems that you have with biases and with, I, I, kind of pixel grain issues on there. And it's just not all that great. Uh, however, when you start adding a little bit of randomized jitter to the samples, you know you have to take quite a few samples to make it look decent. Uh, it changes the picture completely. And four randomized samples is probably going to be our baseline spec for uh, you know, normal kind of shipping quality uh, on the next game. And that looks pretty good. There's a little bit of, if you look at uh, broader soft shadows on there, there's a little bit of kind of fizzly pixel jitter as things jump around on there. But the randomized stuff does look a lot better than any kind of static uh, allocation on it. But it should be a good enough level on there. And the nice thing is, because 
the shadow sampling calculation is completely separated from the other aspects of the rendering engine, you can uh, toss in basically as many samples as you want. In my current research, I've got uh, kind of a zero sample one, which is just the hardware uh, percentage closer filtering for, uh, for comparison, a single sample that's randomly jittered, four samples is kind of the baseline, and also a 16 sample version, which can give you very nice, high quality soft shadows on there. And I'll probably toss in even higher ones, like a 25 or 64 uh, sample version on there, which would mostly be used for offline rendering work. You know, if people want to go ahead and have something render and they don't mind if it's running uh, you know, a few frames a second. You can get literally film quality uh, shadowing effects out of this by just changing out the number of samples that are going on in there. Because this does wind up being very close to the algorithm that Pixar has used in a great many of the, the RenderMan based movies and it's just running in the GPUs now at real time at the lower sample re uh, levels. So that's pretty exciting because in addition to soft shadows, which is the buzzword that people look at where, okay, you've got you know, a shadow line on the floor. Is it an exact binary uh, difference between in light and in shadow, or do you have a nice uh, you know, smooth umbra and penumbra area in there? Uh, the, almost, the probably more significant aspect that we get out of that is the randomized dithering and jittering and everything that goes on in there allows us to go ahead and have good high quality shadows on normal mapped characters. <laughs> Now, there's a lot of things in Doom that are sort of limitations on what the technology does well that we just work around and you don't really notice them because we work around them well. Uh, one of the major ones is that if you have normal shadowing turned on on surfaces that have a high degree of curvature encoded in the normal maps, uh, basically like characters, and uh, you see it's to a lesser degree on things like pipes and stuff like that in the world, uh, the fact that it goes from binary light into binary shadow at a silhouette edge where you have normals that curve around that past the silhouette should still be directly lit gives you this very harsh uh, lighting condition. Sometimes the designers crutch up for that by having uh, fairly bright fill lights so that the shadow isn't very harsh. But when we wanted to do uh, stronger lighting, almost all of the characters have uh, no self-shadowing set as a flag which is uh, a hack that we do in, uh, uh, in the, sten uh, the stencil shadow buffering so that characters with this set will not cast shadows on themselves so you don't get the harsh silhouette shadowing, but they still cast shadows onto everything else in the world. And there's a few things that this screws up where uh, it's not really unique per character on there. It kind of batches things into the two groups, no self-shadow and global shadow. So no self-shadow things don't cast any shadows on other things. So you'll see this sometimes where two monsters standing right next to each other with a light off to the side. Uh, they'll both cast shadows on the floor, but if they're both no self-shadow, you won't get a shadow from one monster on the other monster. I, but the primary thing that this prevents us from doing is dramatic close-ups on characters with I, you know, self-shadowed lighting going on. And this was one of the major limitations for what we couldn't do with otherwise very high quality surface lighting. Uh, so the shadow buffer solved that very, very nicely in that you can have a, a light directly on a character even without an ambient light and you get a soft silhouette on there, uh, which is, you know, which really does what we need to on there. Uh, so the other things with the soft shadows, there are, it's interesting when you, I've got it set up right now in my research engine where I can toggle between uh, you know, the original Doom render and a new renderer using mostly the same data on there. And soft shadows are, are held out as, this, you know, as a grand new feature, but for the most part when you walk through Doom toggling between, self, you know, between soft shadows and, uh, and the, the regular harsh shadows in Doom, there's very few places where it really makes much of a difference. Uh, if you're just kind of toggling between them, somebody a little ways away from the monitor won't even notice it unless there are uh, items that are set in as no self shadow uh, that wind up getting shadows on them. That's the only thing that you really notice uh, when you're just flipping between it. There's a couple scenes where if you look a lot, look closer, it's really nice to see uh, a good soft shadow and everything there. But for the most part, it doesn't make a huge difference. Uh, some of that is because, again, we, uh, the designers know not to put in things where harsh shadows look bad. Uh, so things will have, they'll have a little bit more artistic freedom with that. But the primary benefit of it is going to be, one, getting, uh, 
getting proper self-shadowing, avoiding the silhouette edge problem on major characters. And we should eventually see speed ups from this by unloading the CPU from the shadow calculations. However, at this point right now, the shadow buffer solution is quite a bit slower than the existing stencil shadow solution. Some of that is due to hardware uh, API issues where right now I'm using the OpenGL pBuffer and render texture interface which is a god awful interface. I, it has far too much heritage from bad X Windows design decisions in the SGI days and I've been I had some days where it was the closest I've ever been to switching over to D3D because the APIs were just that appallingly bad. Uh, unfortunately, well, both ATI and NVIDIA have their, their preferred direction for doing efficient rendered texture. Uh, because the problem with uh, the existing APIs is not only are they crummy bad APIs, they also have a pretty high performance overhead because they require you to switch OpenGL rendering contexts. And for shadow buffers, that's something that has to happen hundreds of times a frame. And it's a pretty big performance hit right now. So both ATI and NVIDIA have preferred solutions for this. And as usual, they're not agreeing on exactly what should be done on it. Uh, and it's over stupid, petty little things. I've read both of the specs. And I, I could work with either one. They both do the job. And they're just silly syntactic things and I have a hard time empathizing with why they can't just get together and agree on you know on one of these. Uh, I am doing my current work on on NVIDIA based hardware so it's likely I will be using their extension. Uh, the issues with the current hardware right now are the NV40 has a few things that make development easier for me. Uh, it has floating point blending which does uh, save me some passes on what I'm doing. We'll certainly have fallback positions so that anything that we do with blending we can do with an additional render and another texture copy pass on there uh, to work for NB30 and R300 class hardware. But it's nice and there's also the pretty much unlimited uh, instruction count on the NB30 stuff where there are times when I'm writing these large programs, uh, large fragment programs, and it's nice to just be able to keep tacking more and more things in there as I look at it. But I know full well that I will eventually have to, in some cases, segment these into things that can run on R300 class hardware. But the, uh, the other issues with just raw performance on the shadow buffers is that uh, a lot of people used to think that uh, stencil shadows, because of the fact that in the, the basic direction you would be rendering front faces, back faces, and silhouette edges, that it was going to be this large polygon count increment. And it is a lot of extra polygons, but what wasn't immediately obvious was that I, in all the cases that I'm testing so far, the stencil, the shadow buffers actually requires more polygon draws than, uh, than the stencil shadows. And the reason for that is, in all the demos that you see of shadow buffers, uh, to make it look good and performance attractive and all of this, it's always a projected light with a relatively tight frustum. And I, you know, you see comments like this in the RenderMan books where you say, well, try and make your shadow lights like a 20 degree spotlight and use a 2K by 2K texture, and then you'll get good looking shadows and everything on there. The problem is that in games, 99 plus percent of all lights are omnidirectional point lights. And to render a point light with a shadow buffer, you need to have an enclosing polygon on there, which uh, the most straightforward way to do it is to have six planar projections on there. Now, what happens there is that any time that you have an object that crosses these frustum boundaries, it has to be rendered multiple times. And again, in your typical standard graphics demo where you've got a fruit bowl on a flat plane, I am the whole object fits inside one frustum projection and it's obvious you only need one extra rendering of those uh, of that geometry to create a shadow buffer and then you use it. Uh, however, again, in real life, uh, or at least real game life, we have many, many objects that are part of the scenery that uh, instead of being contained inside a light frustum, Many objects contain entire lights when you're looking at parts of the room, which means that some of the geometry needs to be rendered up to six times on there. And even when it's only rendered on average twice, it's actually more polygons than, uh, than you would see with the stencil shadows. So that's, it's an interesting performance characteristic from there. But polygon rates on the hardware is, are really, really high now and only getting higher. So I don't think that's going to be a huge issue. Another factor involved is 
what you see with offline rendering tools that use shadow buffers a lot, there's you commonly have to do a lot of tweaks with the bias to get things exactly right. There's two kind of standard problems you have with shadow buffers that are artifacts. Uh, if you have the bias set too low, you get what's called shadow acne, which is where you get little splotches of dark shadow on surfaces that are directly illuminated because uh, the depth values there weren't enough to bias completely off of the surface. Uh, when you've got jittered sampling on, that just gives you a little bit of a kind of a dimmer look on them uh, with a little bit of extra noise. And it's not horrible, but it's still not something you'd really like to have. Uh, the other artifact that you get when you have biases too large is you get shadow pull away, which is when you've got a surface that actually contacts a floor, the shadow doesn't start, say, right at a character's heel, but it starts some number of pixels behind it because of the way the biases work. And that's a fairly objectionable artifact when you look at it, I, when you see benches and things like that with the shadows not starting directly at them. And there's a few things that make this difficult I, in, in a number of ways. Uh, one problem is that the depth buffer, uh, if you use normal depth buffering for this, isn't linear. Uh, because it has a perspective projection or projective perspective warp into the depth buffer, if you have a bias that's correct for something that's right in front of a light, it's actually incorrect for it when it's a long ways away. And that's a pretty fundamental problem with that. It can be addressed by, instead of using depth buffering and the actual real depth buffer, you could have uh, you know, have your fragment program render out an alpha channel that's a floating point value that's in linear object space, and you could have consistent depth values across everything like that. Uh, another issue is that it's often, uh, if you just programmatically add uh, a bias value in, like when you're rendering or when you're comparing against it, uh, you're again, you're adding a linear world offset to your nonlinear depth offset. Uh, you can sort of fix that by using polygon offset rendering to add a nonlinear small unit bias on there. Uh, a problem with that is you can add the offsets there. Uh, several people suggest using the polygon offset factor uh, calculation to offset from the uh, slope of the plane. That's not usable in a robust real engine because for any factor value that you get, you will eventually find some cases where tiny, tiny subpixel polygons have a uh, a factor plane calculation that is almost infinity. And you will get those things with, if they're multiplied by anything, they will drop in or out of uh, your shadow map. And I saw that when I had some of those in there where I would occasionally get one pixel out of a shadow map that would be uh, clear to the light, even though it was completely inside an enclosed mesh on the character. And that was just because some tiny little polygon turned almost edge onto the light and the factor value blew it out through the back of, a, of the world and you got to see through that, which would show up when you had a, uh, like a light that was projecting a long distance with a relatively low resolution map. You see the little bright speckles sometimes jumping through things. So uh, the solution to all the bias problems is uh, there's a completely robust, solid, great way of doing it that solves all the problems. And that's to actually render two shadow buffers, uh, one using the front facing triangles to the light and another one using the back facing triangles to the light. And then you combine those together to find a midpoint value between all of the surfaces. And that works great. I haven't seen any situation where that doesn't do as good a job as possible in there. Unfortunately, it means twice the shadow buffer and the sh twice the triangle renderings for shadow buffering on there. Uh, the current plan of record is that we will probably be using uh, probably back face renderings as our default, and then we'll offer midpoint renderings as a higher performance or higher quality option at a performance cost. Uh, and again, this will likely become a highly optimized path for, uh, for the hardware vendors. Another uh, somewhat interesting aspect of the hardware interactions on this is uh, it may very well turn out to be uh, that 16-bit depth rendering, which is uh, a mode which is almost not used at all by any current rendering systems. You know, we've, we like our 24-bit depth buffers for rendering views because we all want to render you know, large, large outdoor scenes that easily swamp a uh, 16-bit depth buffer. But 16-bit depth buffers may be very useful for shadow buffers. Uh, not only do they take up less memory for very large ones, but they should render somewhat faster and sample somewhat faster, because most lights won't have these incredibly large uh, you know, frustum distances that we see with views on there. So there are a few things that become more challenging with uh, the shadow buffers. 
Uh, there's, there's issues with stitching together the multiple planes. Like if you do six renderings uh, you know, of a cube face to go ahead and make an omnidirectional light, you want to go ahead and have them meet up completely seamlessly and not having any double shadowed or double lit surfaces. Uh, and you don't want to have uh, the sampling with the jittering and everything kind of noticeably change planar orientation at there. And that was something that took a little while to work out perfectly, but you know, it, it does the job right now and you really can't tell, uh, tell any difference on it. Uh, outdoor lighting is something that becomes more challenging with shadow buffers because uh, if you have, if you wanted to do a straightforward parallel projection from sun or moonlight onto your world, you would need a, a resolution to your shadow map that was large enough to basically cover your entire world or everything that could be seen on there. And if you chose even a very large value, like a 2000 by 2000 map I'm on there, and you had a decent sized outdoor world area, uh, you would find that the shadows that you'd get from trees and little things protruding up from the ground would be very blurry and fizzly because there's not enough texture resolution there. Uh, there's been some work recently by people exploring perspective shadow mapping, where you try and use a perspective warp uh, to get more detail from a given shadow map resolution where you are. And I don't think that's going to be a really usable solution for games because there will always be a direction that you can turn into the light where the perspective warping has uh, you know, either very little benefits or even makes it worse, where you wind up with more distorted pixel grain issues uh, on there. So the solution that I'm looking at for uh, outdoor lighting on there is a multi-level uh, sort of mip map cropped mip maps of shadow buffers on there where you have your 1k by 1k shadow buffer which renders only the uh, say the 2000 units nearest you uh, and it's cropped to exactly cover that area dynamically and then you go ahead and take you know start scaling by powers of two out there till you've covered the entire world which may require um, you know rendering five or six shadow buffers, depending on how big your outdoor area is. But that's really not that big of a deal, and it winds up being like rendering six views for, uh, you know, for a single point light in an indoor area. And I think that's a pretty solvable problem. So there's a lot of other interesting trade-offs that get made with the shadow buffer approach on there. Like there's an obvious thought that, well, uh, you'd like to be able to use cube maps for shadow buff buffering on here. You render your six views into the cube map, and then you just sample the cube map. Current hardware doesn't deal with that well because you wind up doing, you use one of the other texture coordinate values as the compare to value and you can't directly do it now, although there's some hacks that you can do with referencing a 2D texture and indirecting into, or referencing a cube map that indirects into an unrolled 2D texture. But interestingly, it turns out that that's probably not even what you really want to do because to do efficient shadow buffers in a real game engine, you need to be changing the resolutions of these shadow maps all the time. You know, you can't just render, if you're seeing 50 lights on there, you really can't render 2K by 2K shadow buffers for everything, especially when a lot of the lights may only be 50 pixels across in their affected area. So uh, what I do is I actually dynamically scale all of the resolutions uh, for every single light that's drawn based upon how big it is in screen. And you can, you can throw other parameters into the heuristic that you use for deciding that. But because of the way I select out the areas that are going to be receiving shadow calculations on there, which I actually use stencil buffer tests, uh, so all the, all the work with stencil buffers and uh, you know, the algorithms for that is still having some payoff in the new engine, even though we're not using that directly for shadowing. But because of the way I select uh, areas of the screen for that, I don't require clamping or even power of two uh, texturing on the shadow buffers. So they will smoothly scale from 2000 to you know, 1900, 1800 and so on, rather than making any kind of power of two jumps from 2000, 2048 to 1024 uh, and various things like that. And it also winds up saving a lot of um, a really significant amount of memory because we're looking at large buffers here where a 2K by 2K one with a 24-bit uh, a depth buffer, you know, that's 4 million, uh, 4 million pixels at four bytes each. If you were storing a full cube map on there, that's a good chunk of your video card memory right there. So it actually pays quite a bit to go ahead and uh, you know, render one side at a time, at least on lights that are close up. 
Uh, it is possible that there would be some performance benefits to having all those smaller lights uh, where it doesn't take that much space on there rendered directly as cube maps. And there's, there's a pretty appalling amount of hardware going into upcoming, uh, upcoming 3D hardware to allow this single path render into cube maps. I, I have not been a proponent of this, and uh, you know I, I tried hard to get this stuff killed at the last Windows Graphics Summit, I, but it didn't quite work out, and all the things, I, all the extra stuff went in. And the hardware vendors, I'm sure, will will eventually get it all working right, but I question the actual utility of a lot of the geometry processing stuff going in there with replicating all of the, the viewports and scissors and having basically six different rendering views that you're, you're dealing with uh, at a specific time. Just, it was all driven by this thought that we're gonna wanna render shadow buffers, toss the geometry down one time and the hardware will spit, will spit it all out into the, different, uh, into the different bins. And it turns out that's really not that important. Uh, and when you do that, it winds up having some of these uh, other performance implications where it's not nearly as big of a win as people hoped it would be on there. And I, and even when you do all that, it is a fair amount of hardware cost that's required to implement all of that. Mm. So uh, the shadowing is the big question that goes on there. Uh, I have it working, looking good. Uh, it doesn't handle all the picky cases now. I'm with, mm, I don't have the outdoor lighting done. Uh, I don't have proper individual light specification for exactly how blurry you want the edges to be. And it is worth noting that with shadow buffers, the edge blurring that you get isn't a real shadow um, umbra and penumbra. You know, the, the soft part of a real world shadow is related to the size of the light emitter, um, the location of the occluder, and then uh, the location of the surface that it's on. And you get the different effects like the broadening of the soft shadow from the exact point where it inter intersects the occluder and the surface to a broader one as it goes much further out until eventually small occluders are completely subsumed by um, a broad extended area light source. And you don't get those exact effects but again, this has been the standard for many film quality renderings that have been done for years. And it gives, it gives the designers the control that they need. They can say, well, this light's gonna have a broad angle on it and we're gonna get fuzzier shadows. While this one over here, we have some of the, the light extending over such a large area, we're gonna tighten it down to reduce the noise. And there will be a little bit of tweaking going on there and a lot of different parameters. So in some ways there, there will be more hacking going on uh, on a per light basis than there were with the stencil shadows because the stencil shadows are, they are what they are. They do the exact pixel same thing, uh, no matter what the geometry is, no matter where the light is. And there will be a lot more kind of judgment calls going on with this. Mm -hmm. So the other major stuff that's going on will be lots and lots of different surface models. I, you know, there are some specific things that mm -hmm that we'd like to do with uh, you know, adding some things like subsurface scattering to make skin tones look better, partial translucency to let you get the, the kind of glows through uh, edges of partially translucent things and through uh, you know, like backlit ear lobes and uh, some things to do better hair and so on like that. Um, I was kind of surprised when I asked Tim what the, the most mm, uh, the thing that he would most like improved in the rendering from a game designer standpoint, and the biggest gripe uh, was uh, order independent translucency, where again, Doom does not have a proper solution for order independent translucency. I, we have uh, basically the same approach that we had in Quake 3, where you can assign sort values to different uh, materials, and it will always sort them. Uh, lower sort values will be drawn before later sort values. And there are situations that fundamentally don't work with that. If you have two alpha blended surfaces and you can go to both sides of them, uh, where object A draws in front of object B and then object B draws in front of object A, uh, with the current engine, we cannot make that look exactly right. We would have to do something silly like uh, you know, tell where the player is and change out the materials to things with different sort orders. It'll look right from one side and the other side will have this obvious misblend on there. Now, I had a, uh, a good theory on an attempt to solve this. There's a couple directions that I've got that may, I, you know, that are my options for solving this. Um, one, pa one path is to go ahead and have separate layer views uh, that in addition to rendering to your normal direct rendered view on there, you may have the translucency layer, you know, multiple translucency layers. Mm -hmm. I, where the engine figures out where they overlap, and if you've got overlapping translucencies, it goes ahead and spawns off another buffer, uh, and then it puts them together as necessary. Uh, that still doesn't solve 
single object or single surface uh, self-intersecting translucency, but that's not a problem that I think is really important to solve. Uh, the drawbacks to that would be that it can potentially chew up a lot of video memory. If you run into something where you have uh, you know, three translucent planes and it needs to render those out all separately, that could be many, many megs of video memory spent doing that. And that's something that I, virtualized video memory would help a lot on there because most of these won't cover the entire screen. I am, but it is an issue. The other thing that was sounded like it was going to be a much better direction and may still be our baseline approach uh, is to attempt to do all of the translucency in the single frame buffer, but uh, kind of sparsely scatter the pixels that are translucent on there so that they don't interfere completely with, uh, with the other pixels and then use uh, post-processing to kind of blend the contributions together. Uh, that has, I actually tried some of that early on in Doom, but without the ability to have good post-processing filters on there, you know, it was completely unacceptable. It was just a fizzly mess on there. Um, however, now that we've got the ability to, to do some broad filtering, and I'm doing a lot of things at the back end uh, with filtering to, uh, to improve various things, I am, with that, I was able to set up some, uh, some demos of translucency where uh, the simplest possible case is, say you want a 50% translucent uh, object, you use a separate texture to basically do a stipple test where you only have 50% of the pixels uh, used for that. Uh, and they're completely opaque pixels as far as the render is concerned. Uh, half the pixels inside this area have the translucent object, and half of them are just showing through to what's behind it. From a rendering standpoint, this works really nice. You get all the exact lighting and shadowing, and everything works because everything is an opaque surface. Uh, and then you go back and have a final pass that renders over the translucent objects and basically blurs together the four surrounding pixels there. When you have a fixed pixel grid like that, like this, uh, you know, half of them or every fourth one, and it's on a regular pattern like that, uh, it looks great. It's perfect. I am perfect translucency, accepting shadows. I am, you know, having the light on it. I am, you know, having the surf, the uh, translucency to see behind it, and it works great. The problem is, I, uh, at that level, we could do an improvement over what we've currently got. I, if you were able to specify for a given. Uh, a given translucent object, what its sort of stipple pattern would be. You could then have object A and object B have non-interfering stipple patterns, or, or only interfering in a particular case. And then you get your order independent translucency, and that works wonderfully. Uh, it's more of a problem when you start wanting uh, arbitrary levels of translucency. Now, you can do that in a dithering operation, where uh, if you've got uh, however many, if you're using a 2 by 2 or a 2 by 4 uh, kind of uh, dither mask or stipple pattern for this, you can go ahead and have your fixed values on there, and then you can randomly, either statically or randomly, offset uh, the opacity value that you get from either an opacity map, uh, you know, an alpha interpolator, or whatever you're getting from there. And you can blend that all in and randomly pick and choose between these. But that hasn't been completely satisfactory uh, to me so far, where even if I put in a fairly broad filter kernel, if it's randomly picking the different stipple patterns there, I, it gets, it's still a little too visually noisy for me. So I've got a few different levels that I've got on here where the easiest possible thing is if we pick, I, we can set it up so we can have this randomized stuff, but we have certain uh, good high quality levels, which may be 25%, 50%, 75%, whatever, that look perfect. And then when you're in between interpolating those, you get more and more noise added to it, uh, which is kind of the direction that I'm leaning towards right now, but we'll only be able to see later on when we get more media uh, you know, how much trouble this is actually going to be. So there's a lot of other interesting graphics technologies that may or may not make it into uh, the next engine. And a lot of things, because we've got the flexible programming interface now, I just get tossed in without really affecting the engine. You know, anything that's, uh, that's a non-interacting surface or that's simply specified with the same environment that we would use for our normal lights, it's easy to just throw in uh, a programmable factor there. I, you know, the, the art and craft of engine design is really about uh, what fundamental assumptions are going to be built into uh, the core engine, what's going to be exposed as programmable, uh, you know, programmable features in there, how the workflow, uh, both in the content creation and the utilization of the engine, are done. And there's a lot of things that 
It's tough to say how important some of these things are. Uh, like internally, there's a number of what I consider flaws with the Doom engine, where, for instance, surface deforms when you have something that's uh, an auto sprite or uses some other deform. That happens in the wrong place of the pipeline to get lit. Um, that's obviously something we want to fix in the next generation, where all geometry gets lit and shadowed exactly correctly um, across everything. Uh, there's some interesting aspects to the fact that I originally wrote the, the Doom 3, the core Doom 3 render, which could render pretty much the same pictures that we've got right now. I am, you know, four years ago, and I did it in C. I, it was a fresh start from, I, you know, I basically took Quake 3 at the time, took out the render, wrote a brand new render I, in C, fitting in there and testing it like that. Uh, when the whole team started working on Doom, we did make the decision to move everything over to C++. You know, we got everything included, started building the new, I am, you know, the new pieces of the code base in there, and all the additional work on the render since then has been in C++. But there's still sort of a C legacy to it that the new render uh, won't have, where things will always be set up originally, where you're communicating with objects rather than passing structures. And I got sort of halfway to, to actually changing that in Doom. And when you look at the SDK and the headers, you'll see what were going to be nice new class interfaces, uh, but it's still set up right now where you pass handles to render entities and render lights, uh, along with uh, you know, data structures on there, where that really should just be a class on there. Or it's kind of interesting that when I started on the research a couple months ago for the next generation renderer, I, I sat down to just start testing these things, you know, building some of the interfaces or building some of the, the actual rendering test features. And it was interesting to see that in this kind of experimental mode, I did just fall immediately back to functional C programming for things. I, you know, I wound up making a class to encapsulate the awful render buffer or uh, p buffer and render texture interfaces. But when I'm just hacking around on graphics, it still winds up being more natural uh, to use a functional programming interface. And uh, I'm a little curious if that's just me or if that just winds up being I, you know, the way graphics tends to be done on there. When you start building an app, you know, an actual engine that's going to be interfacing with a lot of different things, then the, the kind of interface rigor of a good object-oriented interface is, you know, beyond question valuable on there. But the, uh, you know, the internals are still a little bit C-ish on there, even on the brand new stuff. So a lot of the issues with rendering engine design are, I, uh, you know, are in these things that aren't actually involved with drawing pictures because everybody draws things the same way now. No matter what you're drawing, it winds up being binding a fragment program, a vertex program, setting some parameters, binding some textures, and then drawing a bunch of triangles. You know, that's the same at the core of absolutely everything that everybody's doing now uh, if you're using 3D hardware. So in theory, I all engines can draw all media from all other engines because at the you know at the bottom line there they're all doing the same thing. Uh, all the kind of innovation and kind of important decisions get made in how you determine exactly what the geometry is going to be, what the textures are going to be, and what the programs are going to be. And that's one of the things that I've always been down on is uh, when people do shader previewers and things like that and shader integration into um, you know, into tools like 3D Studio and Maya, uh, those are really not very useful things because yes, it lets you take this bottom line thing of throw a program and throw some geometry at it, but all of the interesting things that happen uh, in the game engine come from things like interactions and parameter passing and how, you know, how the game world is determining the parameters that are used for the rendering, how the rendering engine composites together uh, you know, either different layers of effects or different parts of programs. And so. You're not going to have that many things that are just, mm, here's a fragment program. Uh, you'll get that for special effects, you know, all the artifact effects where, you know, we've got the heat haze thing that I threw in late in the game and got, you know, used all over the game just because I, people liked that, uh, you know, that type of little thing. So there's special effects like that that you will get some use from that are just, here's the fragment program that does the special effect. But so much of the stuff is going to be dynamic composition of the different programs where if you've got um, you know if you've got opacity mapping uh, where you have to determine which areas are actually going to be drawn on uh, combined with arbitrary interaction programming combined with different shadowing programs combined with deformations of the top level surfaces uh, 
there's undoubtedly going to be uh, this kind of dynamic combining of different programs in there. And that's one of those things that I'm not completely clear yet what the right solution is going to be. So whenever I'm in those cases, I usually implement a couple different paths and just see what works out best. Uh, because there's, there are many different directions that you could possibly take. You know, one of the easiest ones uh, that will probably get tried first is basically adding sort of macro capability to the fragment programs where you could say uh, light calculation here, stick it in register R0, and that might do uh, you know, light combination by two projected textures or it could wind up doing an actual distance-based calculation or use a 3D light. There's a number of different things that you might want to have for kind of light shaders on here that can be combined with arbitrary surface shaders. And and you get similar things like that where you want to be able to toss on a deformation onto an arbitrary, um, you know, an arbitrary surface rendering. You want to be able to say, I want to put the grass blowing in the wind deform on these multiple different things that, you know, we've got sticks and grass and these different things in here that could be used in a static surface, but you also want to be able to have them deformed. And that's, um, you know, that gets also more complicated if you wind up having, say, different tangent space calculations on there where there are some potential advantages to using global maps instead of local maps, even for deformed things where you're deforming full axes rather than moving just the, the vertexes around. Uh, and if you have that type of thing, the sense of what is a normal map may be you know, different. Um, you know, we also have some things like um, height maps may be included in the game, even though they're they're very inferior to normal maps for surface characteristics, but height maps can be used for uh, you know, for other things like if we eventually do have a displacement surface, uh, you know, I, a displacement mapping option in the game, uh, you would need a height map rather than a normal map on there. Uh, there's some cheap hack things like I put in a, a trial of uh, displacement, uh, not actual displacement, but surface warping based on the height maps to try and kind of fake displacement mapping. That didn't work out well enough where you can make a few textures where it looks really cool and awesome, but if you try using it on things in general, uh, you get too many places that are kind of sheared and warped and not looking very good on there. But that's an example of something that's an easy effect to have in, and we can use it for some special effect surfaces and interesting things like that, but it's not a generally use utilizable function. But height maps will also be needed if we do things like I'm you know, bump map occlusion, uh, so you get kind of self-shadowing amongst the bumps in the different areas, uh, although again that'll be at the cost of an additional texture and more problems on there. Uh, I have some interesting thoughts for being able to do uh, sort of a screen space displacement mapping where we render different uh, offsets into the screen and then go back and re-render the screen, warping the, the entire things as necessary for that, which would solve the uh, the T-junction cracking problem that you get when using real displacement mapping uh, you know, across surfaces where the, the edges don't necessarily line up. There's a lot of other interesting things that, you know, that we, we can be doing there. Uh, I expect that I, I will probably have we will probably we're going to be starting media creation uh, using the new technologies uh, pretty soon. Over the next uh, the next month or so, I expect the artists will start working on some of the things utilizing some of the new features like the specularity maps and building scenes with the soft shadows and so on like that. But I am kind of waiting on some uh, help with the hardware vendors to get the shadow buffering up to the full performance that we're going to need to have that as a replacement. But the I would expect that by now, by the end of this year, we'll probably be rendering some demo scenes that will be indicative of what, uh, what the technology is eventually going to be producing. But the renderer will probably take another year to mature to its full kind of final form as far as interfaces, uh, uh, what the programming APIs are going to be, and exactly how the media for, for programming it is going to be used. But I do expect in the end that the flexibility that you're going to have, you're probably going to be programming things at you know, uh, surface interaction level, light level, deformations, opacity level, where if necessary, you can stick in full programs to do really exactly what you want there. I, we're going to have nearly the capability of uh, a traditional uh, scanline offline render. And if you want to take the game and crank the values way up, uh, you can use, of course, textures as big as you want. You'll be, have lots of places where you can turn the sampling levels uh, up a lot higher. I, you know, you can change your, if you want your high dynamic range light blooms to be uh, 
you know, really, really accurate on there. You could say instead of downsampling three times, do them on the native item, you know, the native frame buffer level. And instead of using a separable Gaussian filter, go ahead and, you know, use this real 100 by 100 actual filter on there. If you really, really wanted to have uh, perfect starburst lines coming off of things. And there will be these areas where just changing the data will let you crank up the performance or the quality at the expense of performance to things that are you know, really honestly film quality rendering. I mean, that term gets thrown around constantly, like since the advent of hardware accelerated renderings and lots of people mention things like that for, for Doom, but we're still living in a notchy feature set on the renderer and there's still immense amounts of things that, uh, that the game engines don't do that you need for offline rendering. But with the next engine, you're not gonna have the capability of doing every last little thing you would do with an offline renderer. Um, but you will be able to produce scenes that are effectively indistinguishable from a, a typical offline scanline render if you throw the appropriate data at it and avoid you know, a couple of the things that it's just not going to do as well. Um, and that's going to be interesting. We're seeing graphics accelerated hardware now, especially with the multi-chip, multi-board options that are going to be coming out, where you're going to be able to have a single system, you know, your typical beige box, uh, multi-PCI Express system stuffed with, uh, with video cards cross-connected together. And you're going to have, uh, with a game engine like this and hardware like that, the rendering capability of uh, a major studio like Pixar's entire render farm. And it's going to be sitting in a box and probably cost $10,000. And not only does it have the throughput of a rendering farm, where you're looking at, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, total frames possible rendered in a given amount of time. The important thing is it's going to have a fraction of the latency of it, where if you've got, if it takes 30 minutes to render a film quality frame, you can throw a thousand systems at it and render a whole bunch of frames, but it still takes 30 minutes to get your main frame back. If you can kill the latency down like that, where I, you're actually rendering it in, I am, you know, one thousandth of thirty minutes on there. That's a far, far better thing from a creative standpoint on there. And I think there's going to be some interesting stuff going on. Uh, already, there are studios working with hardware accelerated renderers uh, that are they're coming at it from a different angle. There, where they're coming at it from, how can we take a real offline render and start using GPU technology to accelerate some of it? While we're coming from the side of how do we make a game that's already designed to use all of this very efficiently begin to have all of the features that the offline renderers have? And there will be some interesting overlaps between the two different approaches. But uh, a few years from now, uh, you're going to see it's going to start seeming like an anachronism when uh, a few studios decide to absolutely stick to their guns on the, the huge offline rendering things. It'll still be the case for multi hundred million dollar film studios where they absolutely positively must get, say, certain reflections exactly the way they want, certain filtering exactly the way they want. But everybody that's cost conscious is going to be moving towards this type of GPU accelerated real time rendering. You know, we'll probably see it first in TV shows, but it will not be long until films, you know, film quality rendering is at least using GPU acceleration of classical style renders and perhaps in some cases using effectively game rendering engines. Mm. Now, there's an interesting thing to note uh, about engine technology in general. We've got some uh, in a good example here. Uh, Doom has probably gotten more universal praise for the quality of the audio than it has for the graphics. Mm -hmm. Now, there's some lessons to be learned from this. Uh, I took over the audio engine work uh, this last year after Graham left, and we made some really large changes in exactly what Doom was doing for audio. Uh, when we started off, we knew that we had a lot more CPU power and we could afford to do some sophisticated things with audio. So the original Doom audio engine had uh, you know, head modeling, room modeling, all of the typical DSP high-end stuff that uh, you think about doing for virtual environments and simulations. And it sort of worked, um, but we had, these, uh, we had these option flags where you could say plain sound on here where when the sound designers didn't like the way things were sounding because the engine was mucking with all the sounds, you would just set it to plain. And we were using this in an awful lot of places on there. And when I took over the sound code, I basically uh, redid everything so it had none of those features. And all it does is one-to-one -one mix uh, 
the, uh, the audio data that the sound designers have actually created. And it does some mildly interesting stuff for, uh, for localizing the sounds through portals. But basically, it's a really, really simple engine. It's not much code. Uh, the code is less than half the code that it was when I took over uh, the code base there. And it's, the most important thing is it's nice and robust now, and it does predictably exactly what the sound designers want it to do. So this is a case of it looks like we've got you know, phenomenal sound on all this, but it's a very straightforward, basic thing that it's exposing a good canvas for the designers to work on, where they know what the sounds sound like. They want them to be like this, maybe just quieter, depending on as you're going around. Uh, we've got the ability to have them you know, play non-localized stereo sounds, uh, you know, play sounds that cut off a few different basic features that you've got, like do you want it to be occluded? Do you want it to do portal chaining through there? But basically, all it's doing is taking the sounds, multiplying them by you know, whatever the current attenuation factor is, and adding them together. And this is something that there's always a danger of running into uh, the kind of the sophistry of excessive complexity and sophistication in an engine. And I think we, you know, we ran past that with sound, recovered, and produced uh, you know, exactly what we needed to on there. But that's also always a worry with graphics technologies, where you can do really, really sophisticated things that might be very correct uh, on graphics, especially with light transport. We know exactly how light works. Uh, we can simulate light very, very precisely. If we want to spend the time, we can do photon tracing and radiosity and all these things. Uh, but in many cases, it just turns out that not only is that perhaps not necessary, but in many cases, it's just not even what you want to do from a game design standpoint. Uh, for instance, right here, uh, while I'm being videoed, there are a number of lights set up to provide a, uh, a better view of what's going to actually be captured onto the video rather than the natural lighting of the room that I'm in. And in offline renders, uh, people are always, they're constantly setting up lights that don't behave exactly like real lights or ignore surfaces, don't make shadows, uh, lights that only cast onto certain things. And, and I've always thought that the important things are to provide tools that behave the way the designers uh, expect them to. So if you give a craftsman, you know, you've got talented people creating the media, you know, if you give them tools that they understand that work the way they want them to and hopefully work with a short latency and uh, allow them rapid turnaround and good incremental viewing of uh, what they're working on, that that's the most positive thing that you can do in a game engine. And Doom made several really significant advances for that uh, in terms of media creation. Obviously, the, the level the editor being able to have the, uh, you know, dynamically update the lights and shadows directly while you're making things was a, a really big advance. Uh, having everything set up for fast, rapid media reload, you know, was a big deal. Getting away from the complex offline processing that we had in the Quake series of games, you know, changed it from a 30 minute uh, relight or reviz time to just immediately moving a light or changing its color and seeing it right then and there. Uh, we've got a number of things that we're expecting to improve in the next generation uh, for tightening the integration between game editing and level editing. I, that was one thing where for a long time I was a proponent of separate tools and I, I still think that I had plenty good reasons at the time that we did these things while some people had integrated uh, level editors into early games and we were using separate programs because we used separate hardware at the time for that. Uh, we had really high-end workstations that we could run everything on while some people were editing their games basically on the, the target consumer platforms. But now that those, those specs have basically merged, I, Doom did the right thing and integrated the level editor. But there's a lot more things that we can take advantage of with that integration that we haven't yet. Things like being able to be playing the game and dynamically changing some things. We have sound editor integrated with the game where the audio designers can run around and modify sounds literally while they're playing the game. It's obvious that we should have lighting, light editing the same way. And then there's a few things that we'll take that will follow that same route, but we'll take a little bit more programming design effort to set up. Like we should be able to, you know, reset object positions and while you're playing the game. You should be able to always knock it back to kind of their spawn position, adjust things around, and uh, conditionally restart the level in different places. And that's a lot of the the design work that we're going to be going over on the high architectural level between things. But the overriding concern for us is that I. Uh, we don't want the next game to take as long to make as Doom did. So we're, we're going to uh, be pretty rational about how, 
how grand we're going to be making these changes. I'm confident the render will take less than a year to make, which gives us plenty of time to go ahead and get full, uh, you know, full skill base and utilization and uh, have time to polish everything with that. But most of the other changes throughout the system, we're going to try and have things set up so that we don't force the level designers to work with really broken stuff for a year or more before they can actually really start working on things. I, you know, we have, and we're all pretty excited about where we're going with the next title, and we're not saying much about it yet. But I think it's actually a pretty good, a pretty good plan when you're pushing new technology, uh, like the new Doom engine, to have the first version come out be the single player experience where people are expecting it to run a little bit slower, and you can tolerate all that in those conditions. And then when expansions and uh, sequels and things like that come out that use the same technology with another year or two of hardware progress all of a sudden what was a uh, a borderline experience speed wise on one system becomes again 60 frames per second running locked uh, on the later hardware and that's a better environment for multiplayer because the multiplayer systems really you can we're over the knee of the curve in terms of the benefit that you get from adding cool new graphics to multiplayer systems. Uh, obviously, some of the very popular multiplayer games really don't have that good of graphics, and they're really popular because they're fun. I, now, we can make fun games. We certainly think that we do good game design all of our current stuff. But if id Software wants to play to our strengths as a company, where we've got all this great technology and media in addition to game design and gameplay work on here, I, we're going to be producing another game that has a strong immersive single player experience with a, a minimalist multiplayer, again, about the level of Doom, where it's there, it's a basis. If people want to expand upon it, uh, they're free to. And then we'll have uh, partner companies probably work on taking it to the real super high level of polish uh, that's kind of demanded for a multiplayer oriented game nowadays. Mm. I thought about actually showing little snippets and uh, in, snippets and scenes from the new technologies that I'm working on here, but we decided that uh, programmer demos just don't put our best foot forward, and I'd hate to have some blurry shot that somebody took from here posted up on all the websites as id Software's brand new technology that shows my box room with one character in it and some smudge that's supposed to be really cool on there. I'm. Next year, once the artists and level designers have had an opportunity to actually build real media that exploits the new capabilities, we'll be showing some really cool stuff. Mm.